the act of saying there's no God is an irrational act. And I think it's usually driven either by a, a false impression of what the Christian God is like, uh, and, and people don't want there to be such a being, Welcome to Biblical Demand and today our guest is Dr. J.P. Morland who is an American philosopher, theologian and Christian apologist. He currently serves as Distinguished mm -hmm. Professor of Philosophy at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. In addition, he has authored, edited and contributed papers to 95 books including Does God Exist, Universal Consciousness and Existence of God, The Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology and many more. He has also published over 85 articles in journals. He was selected in August 2016 by the best school as one of the 50 most influential living philosophers in the world. I'm excited to have you here, sir. It's my privilege. Thank you for inviting me. So, I mean, it's so good to hear about your introduction that you are a philosopher and also a theologian. So tell us about your story and your background. How did you come to know Jesus? I went uh, to the University of Missouri to be a to major in physical chemistry. And in 1968, I heard a presentation my junior year on the historical reliability of the resurrection of Jesus. And so I'd never heard that there was evidence for God or Christianity. I, that was a foreign notion to me. So I began to look in to uh, God's existence and the reliability of the Bible and after reading some books and talking with some people, I became convinced that it was really likely to be true. And so in November of 1968, I gave my life to Christ, and it was the greatest decision that I've ever made. I'm 72 now. I've walked with the Lord 52 years, and it's been a tremendous uh, adventure. And I ended up getting a PhD in philosophy because I saw that Almost all the important questions people were asking uh, boiled down to the discipline of philosophy. Not all of them, but many of them. Wow, that's so great to hear that uh, the resurrection has led you to the faith. And it's long back in 1968. Uh, so the Christian worldview firmly believes in the concept of mind, body, and soul. On the other hand, we see few people... <laughs> Uh, those who believe that there is nothing beyond the physical body. So are we more than a physical body? In other words, how do we know we have a soul? <clears throat> well, a soul is uh, what contains consciousness and it animates the body or makes the body alive. And if, if we didn't have a soul, we would not have free will or moral responsibility. Um, you could not blame me for things I did wrong, or even praise me for caring for the poor, or whatever it would, uh, it would be, because to, to blame or praise somebody, you have to assume that what they do or don't do was up to them. It was their choice. If they weren't able to do it, they can't be held guilty for it. Uh, uh, so if I'm my brain and my, uh, my body, my brain and body are governed by the laws of nature, you know, but strictly material objects don't engage in free will. <laughs> uh, so it, uh, we all know that we're free. We, we're aware of sometimes we do things freely. And that can be true only if I am the kind of thing that is could transcend the material world and not be controlled or determined by its laws. And that means that I have to be an immaterial self of some kind, or a soul, or an ego, or a mind. So that's, that's one reason. Uh, another reason I'll make very quick is that my body is constantly gaining parts and losing parts. Uh, if I get my uh, arm cut off in uh, surgery, um, I have an 80% body, and if my body is gaining and losing parts, it's not literally the same body because a material object can't retain its identity if it changes parts. 
but I am the same. I know that I'm the same from moment to the next. Uh, and that means that I can't be my brain or my body because it is constantly in flux. So I have to be a partless thing, a simple soul, which in order to ground my being the same through part replacement of my brain and my body. Those are a couple of reasons why I believe in the soul. There are several, but I, you know, I don't know where you want to go with this. Yeah, so I, I hear you that saying that free will is also leads to the uh, that uh, that we are more than a more than a physical body because uh, there's something called consciousness and uh, I think this consciousness and soul uh, does exist. Am I right? Absolutely, the soul is uh, what has consciousness. Consciousness is a set of uh, properties or states that are in the soul. Uh, so uh, the soul is the container, you might say, of the conscious states. It isn't in the brain. Although the brain can affect the soul, uh, just like if I'm in a car driving around and I'm uh, locked into the front seat and can't get out of the front seat, uh, I can move, drive around town as long as the car works. But if something happens to the steering wheel and it will only turn right, then that's going to limit my ability to do certain things, but that doesn't prove on the car. Uh, I, I'm, it's consistent with me being the driver of the car. So when I'm in my body, I depend on it working for me to engage in different mental functions. And when I leave the body and die, then it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I am the thing that inhabits my body. I'm not my body, but there is a an effect. My my mind has an effect on my body and vice versa. Yes, yes, absolutely right, absolutely right. So, uh, since we know we have a soul, and uh, um, and we also know that every person carries a worldview, and, and that helps us in order to perceive the world. So, I want to ask that: Is worldview required to pursue the truth? I don't think so. Uh, if it were then you wouldn't be able to pursue the truth of your worldview. Uh, <laughs> because you'd have to already have it before you could pursue truth about it. So I think that it is possible uh, to, to gain evidence that God, a personal creator God exists and is separate from the world. I think there is strong evidence for that. And I think that evidence... Uh, Rajad will work for anyone, whether they have a world, whatever worldview they have. Now, it's still true, though, that worldview is of great help in discerning the truth. So I wouldn't want to live my life without having a worldview, but I don't want to say that I just chose it. Uh, arbitrarily, or maybe because I was born in a certain country, that's my worldview. I want to be able to say that I hold the worldview I do because the reasons for it are better than alternative worldviews. Mm. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. And uh, yeah, so worldview is, uh, I mean, as you said, that it doesn't matter where I live, I in order to follow that worldview, right? And right, We're, right. Yeah. So as we know that every human uh, desire to live a truthful life, I mean, we cannot deny whether it's an atheist or theist. At some point, they seek the truth. And sometimes uh, we know we, we know the people ignore the truth. Maybe yes. they are not, uh, they, they cannot comprehend the truth or they don't know how to know something is true. So the question is, uh, is there any criteria or process to know something is true? Um. No, uh, because uh, different objects will be known in different ways. So, for example, the way that one might know subatomic particles is different than the way one might know uh, the psychological problems a human being is having. That's different than the way you know logic 
and arithmetic or mathematics. That's known in a completely different way uh, and, and, and so on. So uh, what I would say, uh, Rajat, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, is that uh, there, are, there are ways of knowing, but they're grounded in the thing that you're, you're pursuing. And it isn't one way of knowing for everything. Now, there are general tests. Uh, if, if you have a theory that, exp that you're going to claim is reasonable, it has to be internally coherent. It can't contradict itself. It has to explain all of the facts that, are, that need to be explained. Uh, and uh, it, it needs to be something that I find livable, that I can at least try to live consistently with it. I might fall short, but I'm, I can at least try to do that. And the reason I'm a Christian is because the concept of a creator and of Jesus Christ being God's visiting the earth, this earth to make himself re known better, make perfect sense. It's coherent. Uh, it, there's a lot of evidence that supports it. We know the origin, the universe began to exist. Something had to cause it and it, whatever caused it had to be completely non-physical and out and so on. So we, we have reasons to believe in God and we have historical evidence that the New Testament are extremely good history and the, the life and the, and the deeds and teachings of Jesus are, are highly accurately reported. And there is a strong case that he rose from the dead and that he was the savior of the world. And so I'm a Christian because I think it makes more sense than any other worldview. I'm not saying other worldviews don't make some sense, but this one I think is just more reasonable than the others. Yeah, <clears throat> pretty interesting to know that, uh, that uh, Truth uh, in other worldviews at some point may be true. Um, I mean, we cannot deny and some part of must be true. But on the other end, the Christianity, the evidences we have for the resurrection of Christ and the Gospels makes it true because we have the evidences and the history. We have a history also we, and experiential also. And as you said, the, the, it is also coherent. I mean, correspondence and coherence theory. That's right. Yes. Hmm. So Bible clearly says that in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that for since the creation of the world God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So my question is that can a rational person deny God's existence? No. Uh, a person could be rational in a whole other number of other areas of life. So they would be rational, let's say, because they knew a lot about economics or literature or what have you. But, but I believe that the act of saying there's no God is an irrational act. And I think it's usually driven either by a, a false impression of what the Christian God is like uh, and, and people don't want there to be such a being. Uh, uh, one of the uh, great Amer leading American atheists said that his problem is he doesn't want there to be a God because he doesn't want there to be what he calls a cosmic authority that he has to answer to. Okay, well, that's, some, that's what makes him an atheist. Others is that they had a father figure that, that was very harsh and mean to them, and they see God as this harsh mean father figure so they have a distorted view of god so uh, some people just want to have sex and live any way that take drugs and live any way they want to they don't want it to live a holy life so i think a lot of the reasons rajada is that people don't want there to be a god and i think those who do and still don't believe may not have been thinking carefully about the evidence of creation look all you have to do is to look at this world and say it didn't have to be here. Some, I mean, this it's just pretty obvious that the question, where did it come from? Uh, how did this get here? Is a, It makes sense. 
And it, it seems to be unbelievably designed. I mean, you look at a little butterfly and it comes out of this crazy little sack of fluid. I mean, the whole thing is, uh, it's mind boggling. And uh, you, so there's a designer and you begin to, to reason that way. And I think it makes much better sense than, well, this all just happened, you know, and, and that's pretty hard to swallow. Yeah, absolutely correct that uh, rational person cannot, I mean, uh, they're rational people, but they, as you said, that they, they don't want some father figure, those, are, you know, they need to obey, they have to obey to, uh, because uh, in my experience, I've seen that uh, atheists don't want someone to tell them do's and don'ts, right? They want to do whatever they That's want right. to do. That's right. That's right. And also, also I've, I've uh, read somewhere that uh, most of the people do not, uh, in, not in a quest of truth, but happiness. And that's why whatever is going to make them happy, they are going to believe that. That's exactly right. Uh, we have a tendency to harness our minds to justify pursuing what we like. And uh, a lot of, many times we, what we like isn't real or true, it's distorted. <laughs> And I mean, we've all done that. I've done it, you know, too much, I eat too much sweets, you know, and that's not good for me. But I justify it by saying, well, you know, I'll quit tomorrow or something like that. So we've all done that. Correct, correct, correct. So as we see, uh, as, we, uh, as we know, Christian worldview knows that uh, God is immaterial, is non-physical entity. And, but when we see the Christ, Jesus Christ, who became... Uh, as the uh, Bible says in the Gospel of John, that word became flesh. So does Jesus manifest the true living God, the God of universe? Absolutely, because um, we are told in Hebrews that he is the exact representation of the unseen God. Now, um, and all the evidence points to that direction. His friends who lived with him for three and a half years said that they never one time saw him ever, ever commit a sin of any kind. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but if you lived around me for three and a half years, it'd be pretty tough for you to say that. <laughs> and, and, and I'm trying to, and they all, many of them ended up dying martyrs' deaths because of what, not of, because of what they believed, but because of what they actually saw. And I don't think you're going to go around telling people that, plus telling people that Jesus had the power to conquer death itself, unless, unless it was true. I mean, I, and so I believe that their report uh, is that Jesus, his, the way he, he behaved, the way he thought and felt, the, the quality of his character, to be honest with you, the power he had over nature uh, that no other human being has ever had, these were all precise manifestations of the kind of person God is. Now, of course, his body wasn't, because God doesn't have a body, but that was his human nature. So they weren't talking about his human nature uh, uh, manifesting the nature of God, but his divine nature in combined in the human nature was what did it. Mm, yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right that the miracles he did and the, the, his sayings and uh, as you said, uh, as you uh, highlighted the, his command over the nature as really impeccable, I mean, uh, unmatchable with any human being. And apart from there, we know Bible has many evidences that Jesus is the Messiah, the God. Yes. Right. So uh, my last question is that any advice for the Christian youngsters as in this Internet age where the philosophies and worldviews sound compelling to them and they think, <laughs> OK, this is also right. So how so what advice would you give? I would start my investigation of worldviews by investigating Jesus. And, there, and I'm not saying that because I'm a Christian. I'm saying that because I think almost everybody would say that he is most likely 
the most significant figure in world history. So I, I would say, why not start with someone that is universally admired, almost everybody admires Jesus, and assess the evidence. Uh, uh, try to get hold of some simple books you could read that actually talk about reliability of uh, uh, the New Testament documents, let's say. Now, if you begin to seek to grow as a Christian, you decide, I'm going to pray to Jesus and seek to grow. If you start getting questions that you can't answer, and they're raising doubts in your mind, do two things. Number one, write those down on paper and try to find someone or Google it and find someone online that answers that question. That's number one. Number two, realize that just because you can't answer the question doesn't mean there aren't thousands and millions of people around the world who've already answered it. So you're not alone. You're part of a family. And this family has got some people in it, uh, you know, like, like you and like me, uh, who have a special calling to try to help people with these kinds of questions. So if you're a new believer, or if you're looking into Christianity, and you have problems with accepting it, find someone, because there is someone out there that's answered it. And talk to wise friends, watch podcasts like this all the time. Watch this every time because you're going to gain information that's going to help you grow as a Christian. And uh, go online and try to Google uh, important websites. Rajat will be sharing those with you uh, session after session, and over time you'll learn which ones to go to. And uh, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, that's great. That's a good, really a good advice that if you have any question regarding your faith, so write it down and find it online because the people get the same questions over and over again. And all these questions have been already answered by the people like you and other apologists. So that's a really good advice. And uh, uh, as, as, as I, I was hearing one of your uh, sermons at loving God with all your mind. So could you just uh, share something about the loving God with all your mind means? Well, yes, thank you for asking me that. Well, Jesus was asked what was the greatest commandment, and he said, the, if you want to summarize the Old Testament in a sentence or two, <laughs> that's pretty hard to do, but if you, if you want to do it, the best summary would be this. Love, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, <clears throat> and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, when he said love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he, he, he wasn't just limiting to that, but what he was saying was, love God with every facet of your, of your life that you have. Love him with everything. That means you've got to love him with your heart and your feelings because you want to worship and, and have an affection for him. You want to love him with your will by trying to obey his teachings when he teaches things. But you also want to love him with your mind. And that means to learn to see, the, to think about the world the way he did. To learn to come and actually believe uh, and know what you believe and why you believe it. Those are, the, those are two crucial ways to love God with your mind. Know what you believe and know why you believe it. And that is, that is an important part of a lifelong love of God with your mind. Exactly. And that's what makes Christianity a rational faith than a blind faith. Absolutely. Because, yeah, because we know what we believe and, uh, and why we believe. So it was really a good uh, time with you, hearing from you, and it was uh, due for a long time. And thank you so much for joining me. My brother, it has been my privilege. I'd like to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. I'm so proud of you and your work. God bless you, my brother. Thank you so much. <music>